Well, hello. It is an honor to be here. And thank you for taking your morning to come here and look ahead, right? And we're looking ahead today at a pretty amazing thing, artificial intelligence, which has been in the news everywhere. And Envision understands that when we have conversations about these difficult things, we can see better for ourselves, for our teams, for our families. And uh, I had the honor of uh, being recruited by Phil to come and talk about this because I'm one of these futurists who's been studying this phenomenon for the last 20 years and from a complex systems perspective, from an adaptive perspective, right? How does life adapt to accelerating change? And uh, we're definitely in that world today, aren't we? So it's, a, it's an amazing time, really, to, uh, to be in. So um, my slides are available at this link here, uh, Foresight U, Foresight University, my or, uh, primary uh, consultancy, um, at Foresight U slash pubs. So <clears throat> anyone who would like to look at the things we talk about today, uh, afterwards, just go to that that website uh, and uh, download them if you'd like. Okay. And our theme today is going to be flourishing, uh, not just prospering, not just thriving, but flourishing. And what does that word mean? If you think of a Johnny Appleseed, somebody who plants seeds that don't necessarily flower during your own lifetime, but they're going to flower. Right? It's called legacy thinking. Right? That's flourishing. And when we think ahead to the next generation, we are taking that perspective, right? It's even more fundamental perspective, really, than, than thriving, which is a wonderful, way, wonderful word, right? Gets us beyond the survival thinking, right? And uh, scarcity thinking. And we really are in a world where we're using these tools to create abundance. And there's good and bad things coming out of them, right? And it's easy to be scared by the bad things we see and disengage. But when we get back to that flourishing mentality, what seeds can I plant today? We are in, I'd say, the perfect place. And I was uh, um, very honored to hear that the Packers table, they brought in high school students. So thank you guys for coming uh, because you guys are the future, right? And what you're going to see in your lifetime is going to totally outstrip what we've all seen. And you guys are going to help us sort all this amazing future out. You guys are going to be the ones that are going <laughs> to going to make these technologies work for us, right? So thank you for coming, guys. All right. So who am I? I'm an educator, an entrepreneur, uh, a foresight coach, and leadership coach. And I've got these two wonderful kids, four and eight years old, and they're grown up in a world where they're talking to their smart speakers, and now they're talking to GPT, <laughs> making pictures. What an incredible world, <laughs> right? What an incredible world that they're, they're going into. So um, background in business, started some uh, companies, uh, science tutoring uh, and test preparation companies, uh, then went to medical school for two years, realized, oh, it's not what I, not what I want to do, but you get a master's from uh, the first two years of medicine. And then I went into, uh, I got my master's in strategic foresight. And that's from uh, the University of Houston program. And you've had uh, um, Gary Golden here at Envision, who's also a graduate of that program teaching uh, foresight workshops. And the wonderful thing about foresight is it's been around for, uh, since World War II. So there's a bunch of methods we can use, like scenarios and uh, forecasting and prediction markets and uh, trend analysis. And when we use those tools, before we make strategy, we can get a better outcome. So uh, that's uh, worth thinking about. And my main clients are defense, uh, Navy, Army, Air Force, intelligence. So my slides are going to be kind of word heavy, which is what happens in the defense community, right? Everybody throws lots of words on their slides. You can download them if you don't want, you know, uh, if you get overwhelmed by the words. But uh, basically just listen to what 
my story. Okay, that's the thing that really matters, I think. And that's the thing, hopefully, when we have our Q&A, we can get to those most important questions for us, right, as citizens of our communities. Now, I'm uh, in, in Ann Arbor, another 100,000 uh, person community with a lot of similarities to Green Bay. Uh, another community that has been really revitalized in the last 10 years. Um, and all the knowledge um, economy things that are coming out now with these new tools, it's a pretty exciting story. So um, we're going to get into that uh, today. Okay. And that's my main theme today is that we're really in the knowledge economy. People talked about it, you know, for 10, 15 years, uh, but now we're, we're right smack in it. Um, this is a slide of the purple triangle on it. If there's one thing I'd love you guys to think about for the next 20 years is that purple triangle, right? That's a map of all the schools across um, Wisconsin. And that triangle, which has Green Bay at the top, Madison and Milwaukee down below, that is your highest density of schools, uh, colleges, and it's your highest uh, density of young working professionals, first 10 years out of school. And that part of Wisconsin is just going to continue to accelerate and lead the knowledge economy for your state. So that's the tip of the spear, right? And if you think about how you're valuing and networking those students and those young professionals, I argue that's your number one strategy for keeping your state flourishing in this knowledge economy, right? And where do I get this idea from? Well, it's been around for a long time. In my state, Michigan, there was a report in 2004 saying, hey, you got to get into this knowledge economy. It's got to be your number one thing. You got to leverage your, all your manufacturing into the knowledge economy. And back then, Michigan was 16th in the country per capita income. Okay. They released another report 20 years later, just came out, and Michigan's now 39th. So there's places in Michigan that have leveraged the knowledge economy. Ann Arbor, where I'm from, right? University of Michigan, down the street from me. Um, Grand Rapids, um, several other places. Detroit has finally stopped its decline that we've seen starting in the 80s, and now it is also has several places that are revitalizing with a lot of these knowledge economy businesses that are going to figure out this new world we're going into. So, but that's a long way to fall, right? And Wisconsin has been far better at retaining its manufacturing base. As you guys know, 25% of your, of your jobs come from manufacturing. That's one of the top five in the uh, state, uh, regions in the United States at being able to do that, right? But now your big challenge, I would argue, is how do you leverage that? How do you take that manufacturing strength and extend it to all of the products and services that the knowledge economy are going to uh, uh, create from our manufacturing base, right? And what kinds of things can we do? Well, here's a benchmark. Vermont is now paying off student loans for people who graduate from their, co from their uh, colleges. And for, um, you got to stay a minimum of two years and uh, you get your student loans paid off $2,500 uh, a year. Strategies like this are proven to keep these knowledge workers that you want, that are building this future, in your state. And so I would argue, uh, it's wonderful to hear we have a state senator here. I would argue, look at something like this and say, is this something that makes sense for Wisconsin? Right? Because that kind of thinking is focusing on this tip of the spear, right? Which is this world, this amazing world we're going into. Okay, so what's foresight and what is futures? I've got to explain both of those. So foresight are the methods we use to look ahead. The elevator pitch for foresight is anything you do before strategy. So if you got to explain this to somebody, I was talking to somebody who was telling me about foresight. Uh, 
If you do anything before you go into strategy and then making a plan, that's foresight, right? So you look at industry reports, you look at trends, build scenarios, you look for what are called wild cards, improbable things that would change the whole game if they emerged. Am I ready for that? It's all foresight. Like I said, the field's been around for 60 years, and Vision is leading in the nation right now for getting us as communities to say, well, can I use some of those tools in my small teams, look ahead five, 10, sometimes even 20 years out at these biggest changes and say, well, are we skating toward the puck, as, we, as Wayne Gretzky would say, right? Are we skating toward the puck? Do we anticipate what's coming? And we can do that. And then the other thing that we do in Foresight is called futures. What's that? Futures are just stories we trade about the future. What I'm going to tell you in the future of AI, a lot of this stuff is stories that have been circulating for the last 20 years in the futures community about the future of AI. Bad, the good, and the flourishing, right? So with futures, we want to seek out what are called Weeble stories. How many people are old enough to remember Weebles? Yeah, and what's the tagline? That's right. Okay, kids, a weeble is a toy <laughs> that gets back up. <laughs> okay, I've got, there's, there's a picture of the two I have on my desk to remind me that's what I'm trying to do here, right? Now, why do I want to tell you a weeble story? Because a story that gets attacked is an important story. That's the story where someone might, might lose some business, someone might, power sh might shift between one group or another. But if it gets back up, if the trends keep reporting it, that's not hype, that's not fantasy, that's not a utopia, that's something you need to pay attention to. So I'm gonna give you my best weebles <laughs> in this morning and then in the afternoon, and I'd like you guys to try and knock them down, okay? All right, so, foresight. Where does it fit into how we adapt? Well, there's this in my book, uh, Introduction to Foresight here. I've got a few copies. Uh, I got eight copies for anyone who wants them. I'll put them up at the end of my talk here. Um, and you can get it for free, the digital version of it, at that link that I mentioned, foresightu.com slash pubs. Okay. Uh, we have models for how we use foresight, how we integrate it into our world. So this is the most important model, and it comes from, how many people have heard of the OODA loop? Anybody? Excellent. Okay, so in my field, in defense and intelligence, the OODA loop is this. First, we learn about the past and present, then we look ahead, and that ends with strategy and a plan, and then we act, and then we do what? Review the act. How far am I off from the mark? Okay, if I'm off, what are, how do I need to fix it? Let's go back into learning, and then some more foresight with a slightly different plan, and then act, and then review. Okay, that's called the do loop. Okay, and the takeaway from this slide is that there are different people in your team, in your organization, who like to do different versions of these. And the second takeaway is the green one we like to do the least. <laughs> <laughs> right? Think about that. Nobody wants to criticize themselves or have other people criticize them. But remember our Weeble. If you do that, if you criticize what happened and then you get back up, then you get a better learning step and then a better foresight step and then a better doing step. And the learners are the people in the room, some of you guys here, who will just keep learning, 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 learning something and then you look up and say, hey, wait a minute, am I ever going to use this? <laughs> Anybody here had that experience? Come on, let's see some hands. There we go. Okay, happens to me all the time. <laughs> I gotta pull back. Wait a minute, that's some little rabbit hole in YouTube I just went into. Come on, get back. Let's figure out something that's useful for my life, okay? All right, so this is a very valuable model. The second of three models I'm gonna give to you is called the Foresight Pyramid. Now, who came up with this? A guy named Alvin Toffler. How many people remember him? Yeah, greatest futures of the 20th century. Thank you, sir. Yeah. What did he say? He said, he said, guys, there's three ways we look to the future. The possible, the probable, and the preferable. 
what could happen, what's probably going to happen whether you want it to or not, and then you mix those two together and what do you get? What you want. And that goes to the top of the pyramid. Make sense? That's the one we care about the most. That's in purple. The rest of my slides are going to have green, blue, and purple highlighted in various places to help us think about the power of this triangle. Now, who leads the possible? Individuals. They're constantly creating. That's their main mandate in, in, in yellow there, right? They are constantly experimenting, exploring. Who leads the probable? The things we want to protect, things we want to control and understand and all agree on. Groups. All the groups. We're all members of different groups, right? And we have certain approaches to how we try and understand risk, how we try and control the things we don't want to have, and make sure everybody agrees to the same rules. Now, who leads the preferable? That's a really interesting third perspective we don't always think about. The whole network, the whole ecosystem of all of us interacting in a market. Does that make sense? That's the network perspective. And that we're going to spend a lot of time thinking about because that's the flourishing future. The network is always figuring things out. The whole group, the whole, excuse me, the whole ecosystem of all the competing and cooperating. How many people have heard the term coopetition? What does it mean? It means we try and cooperate first and then compete on a, within a set of agreed upon rules. That's what sports is. That's what uh, capitalism is. That's what democracy is. That's what our moral systems are, right? Our norms. Coopetition. Humans are incredibly pro social. We cooperate and then we compete within the rules and we keep changing the rules, right? So, that network perspective, that's the most important perspective to have. All right. So, now we get to our main topic AI, right? First thing you want to say is it's a long way from NI. What's NI? Natural intelligence. That's what we do. Right? We all have an incredibly complicated brain. 80 trillion unique connections inside of each of our brains. It runs on 20 watts. Think of a 20 watt light bulb. <laughs> no computer is anywhere close to doing anything like that. It has we have complex logic, we have emotions, we have uh, deep world models, models of ourselves, of others, and we have consciousness, this incredible, incredible gift, right? Empathy, ethics. All right. What's AI? Very simply, it's just simulating that system, that amazing system. Is it good at it yet? Yes. It's good at it for some very basic things we're going to talk about right now not for a bunch of the complex things, all right? And it's an amplifier and an accelerator of human ability. That's the other second thing we need to think about, okay? It amplifies for good and, and, and for, for ill, both, what we can do and also what machines can do, what our robots can do, right? And it's a catalyst for mostly good and some bad outcomes, but mostly good. Remember that pro-sociality I talked about that we're built, we're built to cooperate, right? And it's a game changer for foresight. The three P's, the probable, possible, preferable, we can see much deeper into all three of those with AI. And that's, that's powerful, that's useful. Okay? But what are the mindsets we want to have when we think about how to adopt this accelerating thing? Well, a guy named Ethan Mollick, he's a professor at Wharton College of Business, University of Pennsylvania, is probably the best single blogger on the web about generative AI, which exploded into our world in November of 2022. Right? And his blog, One Useful Thing, I recommend uh, anyone go and read some of the articles on One Useful Thing. Now, the nice thing about Ethan is he's finally publishing a book, which is coming out next month, called Co-Intelligence. And if you want one single book after our talk that might help you think through the implications of computers we can talk to for our lives and the computers that can make video and computers that can understand patterns, right? Simple patterns, right? 
the way that they can today, Co-Intelligence would be the book I would recommend. Now, as Ethan says, there's three levels of thinking we can do when we talk about AI. We can think about cost savings and defense. How do we prevent bad things happening? Right? How do we create new efficiencies with these tools? Then we can go to level two where we think about how can I not just get more efficiency in my business, but I can actually and maybe eliminate some processes and some workers perhaps. But how can I grow my market? And what new opportunities can I reach now with these tools that I couldn't before? And then level three thinking, he says, is breakthrough thinking. How are these tools going to change the rules and change the whole environment that I've been operating within, right? And for all of these, we can do short, medium, and long-term thinking. But for level one, we tend to think short-term. For level two, we tend to think medium, which is up to the next four years. And for level three, anything beyond the next election cycle, that's breakthrough thinking. And I'm gonna give you a few uh, weebles today that are breakthrough weebles to think about. What's gonna happen in the next 10 years, right? What's going to happen when you guys are out there in the world building some of these things or interacting with some of these things, right? So anyway, so this book next month comes out, I recommend it. All right, and then the last foresight method I want to explain to you is called STEEPS. Now some of you have gone through the foresight uh, courses at Envision and you may have used STEEP, science, technology, economy, environment, politics, right? STEEPS puts society at the, at the end and science at the beginning. And you need to add science for these accelerating technologies because you can't understand the future of the technology unless you understand a little bit about of the scientific capabilities that the technology has. Does that make sense? So six categories for us to think about when we're analyzing something complicated like this. Now the simplification is that science, technology, and the economy, particularly entrepreneurship, those first three, STE, that's the disruption. That's the incredible speed of change that we're all gonna see. It's science, tech, economy. That's my talk for the first half of our um, session today. And then the second half of our, my talk today is gonna be about environment, politics, society. Those three, are the regulators of all this accelerating technology. And why do we have politics and society in purple? Do you remember that pyramid, purple at the top, the preferable? That's the stuff we care about the most. That's where the flourishing happens, is in our political solutions and the, the, the quality of life, the society we live in. So we put society at the end because Remember how your mom said you got to eat all your vegetables before you get to the meat? <laughs> all the stuff we want to talk about the most, we can't really think well about it unless we step through all five of the others before. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that, that's the last model that I think is really helpful for us as we are adapting to all of this change, crafting the futures, the communities we want. All right. So let's get into these. Let's get into the first three of these this morning. All right, science. So what's accelerating change? Oh, and by the way, this first one, this is going to be maybe the most abstract. The technology and economy are going to be much more valuable for us, right? Science, we don't always think about the science. These guys are thinking about the science when they get to college, right? We get, oh God, I'm done with the science. Let's move on to the other stuff. All right. So the problem is we got to deal with this thing, right? accelerating change okay as Phil knows for the last 20 years I've been in my little nonprofit studying the mechanisms of these right so we think the world's gonna keep going like this you know that little red spot under the guy's feet you know okay yeah okay I can handle that you know but the problem is in these special areas nanotechnology and information technology the stuff just gonna keep blowing up faster than we want to that's just the nature of the probable future at the bottom of that triangle I mentioned to you, right? 
It's that accelerating change that gives us laws like this. How many people have heard of Moore's Law? Okay, that one has good penetration, right? 30 of you, right? Computers getting twice as powerful per dollar since the transistor was invented. 1948, that's a long time. That's a long time to see computing acceleration. Another weird thing that happens with it though is Kumi's Law. What's that? Computers use half as much energy per computation every two and a half years. How's that possible? Well, they keep shrinking, they keep getting more efficient, they keep going into what's called inner space. Does that make sense? They use less resources to do more work. Does biology do that? Not a chance. Our next kid is going to have to use the same resources as we do. IT and nanotechnology, future of of uh, medicine, right? Molecular medicine. You get into the inner space stuff, that just keeps accelerating. Now that's good if we want to solve a medical problem we couldn't solve before, if we want to have a more powerful computer, but it's also disruptive. Does that make sense? It's not going to run out of resources because it keeps diving into this efficiency space. The weirdest thing I'm going to say to you today is Nevin's Law. That's quantum computing. Quantum computing is so fast, it's improving so fast that it's going to finally figure out, it's going to be able to model us at the molecular scale. It's going to finally understand genetics and genetic networks, gene, protein, regulatory networks, all that stuff that you know, our med medical uh, field guesses at today. It's going to figure that out. Now that's not going to happen in the next 10 years, maybe not even the next 30 years. But we can see it already with the inc incredible power of these tools. All right. So there's numbers you can attach to these things. You can look in the green, and these are the kind of things we, this is the kind of growth we understand, right? You know, 2% growth of the economy, 25% growth of a particular new market, okay? Then you get to the red, and that's the digital world. That's Moore's Law and beyond. That stuff is hard, to, hard for us to wrap our heads around. So Moore's Law growing uh, its capabilities at 40% uh, percent a year. And then the amount of data that's produced by all these tools, all these sensors, and then recorded in our networks, right, big data, that grows at 55% a year, right? right? So there's a tenfold increase every five years in data. 60% of the world's data was created in the last 24 months. And that's going to always be true, always be true going forward. So what's the AI going to do with that data? Oh, a lot of good things, right? And then you finally get to deep learning, right? Which is growing its data lakes. Ever heard the term data lake? That's what they call these huge centers that they're training the AIs on now, a data lake, at tenfold every two years. Now, that's going to slow down at a certain point, but right now, that's how fast it's growing. And then you get to quantum computers, right? And Nevin's Law. And you see 4, 16, 256, 65,000, 4.3 billion. That's the computational capacity when you add one more qubit, it's called, to your quantum computer. And we don't know how to make these huge ones yet, but that's how fast they're growing with the small ones we have today, right? And so that's a very, very different future from the world we grew up in, right? So simplify. What does that mean for us 10 years from now? Well, it means we're going to have about 100 times more trainable data. We're going to have roughly 80 times more computing power per dollar, 50 times more bandwidth, right? That's what we're going to have 6G, or 6G advanced even, right? That actually works. So all the glitchiness we get on our video chats, you know, today, all that stuff's gone, right? We're going to have five times more... Uh, Oh, sorry, we're going to have roughly nine times more battery power density, five times more internet connected, connected things, 50% cheaper desalinated water. Oh, that's interesting. What are you going to do with that? And a lot more wealth. And we have to ask ourselves, can we do 10x visioning? Can we think ahead about these things and say, how is this going to enable what I want to have this additional capability, right? All right. So when did AI finally burst into our world? 
in 2012, right? That's when we had computers using these, these neural networks that could recognize cats. Remember that, the cat, the cat videos? <laughs> yeah. That's when we had computers that were smart enough to put captions on all of our internet pictures that were almost as good as what people could put on them. That's why Google Photos now, you can go in and you say, show me the photo of my dog jumping into a lake, and it pops up, right? And these things mimic the way we sense the world. Not the way we think, but the way we take our, what we see in the world and process it into first level images. Does that make sense? That's what they do, right? And then in 2017, Google invented something called the transformer. And what's that? That's a model, the neural network in it, that added the ability to pay attention, see that blue thing, that blue equation on the top? That's what a transformer is. We added neural nets and data, we added attention so the model could focus on specific things in all of those images it was looking at, and reward. The model could reward itself for making a better prediction about what those things made, right? And that gave us something called a foundation model, which is a neural network that you train once with any data set, and it can do a whole bunch of different things. It can produce video. It can understand how proteins fold. It can talk to you. One model, do a whole bunch of things. That's a really interesting new capability. So a bunch of people started talking, starting in uh, roughly 2017, about artificial general intelligence. What the heck's that? Not just artificial intelligence. General intelligence is the ability to have flexibility. You train it for one thing and now it can surprise you and do things with that training data set in other areas. Does that make sense? So artificial general intelligence is the idea that eventually this thing gets powerful enough that it starts doing things like humans do. Now, this is just the very beginning of artificial general intelligence. Most people in the field, in the futurist field, don't think this is something that we're going to see in the next at least 20 years, maybe 40 years. Okay? Why? Because these computers are a long way away from that natural intelligence that I told you about. But what will they do? They'll do specific narrow things like being able to generate video, being able to do simple first step logic, if this, then that, very well. I want you to think of them like a kid that is super world aware, but it's still a kid, okay? Like a sidecar, Microsoft calls it a co-pilot, right? This is a kid co-pilot, okay? That just has seen all, all the stuff in the world, but is constantly making little mistakes and you have to correct it. Does that make sense? That's the next 20 years of AI. Okay, so that's good and that's bad, all right? And so here's Microsoft's strategy in a single slide. What are they gonna do with these tools? Well, they're gonna take this large language model, this foundation model, they're gonna push it into all of their applications and on uh, Office 365, and they're going to create something really interesting called a graph, the Microsoft graph. What's that? That is a graph of all the data that the user has loaded in and that the business has loaded in that the little AI can look at and try and understand the relationships between. Does that make sense? And it's going to be captioning, labeling that relationships, just like the little the AI that I first showed you that could recognize cats. Okay. And you're going to be looking at those labels and say, oh, that's good. No, that's bad. No, that's good. That's bad. I want this. I don't want that. And that is the next 20 years of what we're going to see. Fascinating. And they have a, uh, obvious, uh, not obviously, they have a, a, a safety approach that involves something called guard railing. How many people have heard that term? That's blown up in the last three years. Yeah, what is that? That's talking to your little AI and saying, please don't do this. I don't want political information. I don't want information in this category, right? Don't talk about that. Don't do this, right? You train it to not do that, and then the system doesn't do that. 
Okay? And this is going to be hugely powerful. And this slide tells you why Microsoft's the most valuable company on the, uh, in the uh, equities market today. Right? Okay? Single, single reason. Okay? Because that, that's going, that stuff's going to be very, very helpful. All right. So now we have a slide on Wisconsin executives, small and medium manufacturers. Do they see this future? Well, right now, half of them aren't. This wonderful last month um, survey that I just found on the web for my talk today. Uh, more, slightly more than half of these execs uh, that were polled don't, AI is not going to affect businesses like mine. Okay, that's not true. It's going to affect them, right? And we need to start asking ourselves, how do we see this happening? Okay? And the PC, the internet, the cloud, smartphones, these previous technology waves, a lot of us didn't, in the, in the, in the industry space, didn't see them until later. Some of them saw them earlier, some of them saw them later. This one is just the next wave, right? It's just another version of that, and we have to see it. All right. So let's talk about some of the specifics of the things you can do with these, right? In purple here, here's some of the things you can ask one of these models, whether it's ChatGPT, whether it's Google's Gemini, Microsoft's Bing. What can you say to these things now? First, I want to see how many people have actually done this, have been talking to one of these models. Okay, this is pretty, this is great, this is great. So that's half the people, right? Half of us. Now, what I hope will happen after this talk is you'll go in and you'll play with a couple of these because some of the slides I'm going to show you how I've played with them, okay? And you can ask things like this, you know, is this true? Is there evidence for this? Or is this just one of those clickbaity things out there that I, you know, <laughs> people are talking about, some fake news thing, right? You can also say, uh, explain it to me in this length. I want just two paragraphs. I want a page. I need to do X using Y. What are the typical steps I would do? Here's my resume. How would you improve it? Uh, based on X preferences and Y values, what advice would you give me? Right? Are X and Y related? And if they are, give me five examples. Right? Apply this concept, this framework that I like, to this thing and give me five examples. Or, sorry, sorry, step by step and give me five options. Right? And even finding assumptions. What would need to be true for this wild card to actually happen? And what variables would I measure? And, and I've done all of these, and it's really interesting. You're really going to get a lot of value out of that. So we're in a world now where the learners are inheriting the earth, as, as uh, Eric Hopper would say. And who are the learners? All of us, but particularly our students. Remember my student orientation? That's the orientation we need to really help our, our communities see what we're, how we're going to use these tools. Now, to simplify what I just said, there's five superpowers I'd like you to think about. You could use a tool like uh, a foundation model to question, to investigate, to learn, or to ideate, come up with options, explore, recombine things. You can edit or evaluate things. You can make a plan or an outline, and you can find out who else you might want to connect with who is on the web talking about the same thing. Does that make sense? That's super powerful. Or you can actually build with them. You could use that copilot I mentioned to create code, run it on a computer. You can do what's called generative design, this company Ansys, where you output a model and do 3D printing with it. Right? You can do all five of these things, and like your speaker from last World Future Day said, Tom Frey, the competition isn't between humans and AI, it's between humans who are using and not using these tools over the next 20 years. That's the key competition we want to think about. Right? They're not going to scare us, they're not going to take away our lunch. Well, they're going to scare us, they will, <laughs> but they're not going to take away our lunch. Okay. All right, so here's an example. As a futurist, I've always had this wonderful idea of a garden guardian. For me, it was a wonderful idea. You know, everyone's, all my squirrels in our backyard are stealing our cherries off of our cherry tree. I mean, they just strip it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all of the strawberries are gone, you know, before, half of them before we can eat them. Yeah, I could try and put the big fence around my cherry tree. Imagine how big that has to be, right? 
or I can come up with something that kind of protects, some AI system that protects my garden. Now, growing up, um, my uncle used to use a uh, shotgun with, with, uh, with uh, salt pellets in it. You remember those? Okay, for getting rid of the, the, the varmints, as he called them, right? So I thought, oh, wouldn't it be neat to have this little, like, pellets, fertilizer pellets sitting in a little cage right there, and the thing would, would make a noise, and then if the guy comes too close, you know, that thing kind of steal my food probably in the middle of the night, right? And basically shoot a, shoot a fertilizer pellet at it, and, uh, and then is that going to protect my garden? I thought, oh, that was a cool idea. So I asked ChatGPT to evaluate that idea. And what did I get? I got a wonderful, as you see this whole output right here, it told me, no, that's not really a good idea, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's not a good idea. Animal welfare, you know, land, you know, laws, norms have changed. People are probably not going to think that's a smart thing to have that in your backyard, right? Because we care a lot more about animals, right? Particularly you guys, than where I grew up, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so that was an ethical screen that was very helpful to me. So then I changed my mind and I said, all right, what about a smart sprinkler? What about something that shoots, uh, it makes a noise and then it shoots a, a jet of water? And you know what GPT said to me? I like it. I like it. Let's test it. Let's make sure that the animals don't habituate to it. But I think that's a good idea. I think that's humane. Look at the words that she, uh, she told me. It's non-lethal. It's environmentally friendly. You can water your plants with it, right? So you get double benefit there. You know, you get this. And, uh, and so that is fascinating, isn't it? That I can talk to a system and it gives me, it changes the way that I think about this AI product I might want to eventually make or, or write about, see somebody make so that, you know, in the future we, uh, we, um, uh, get more, get along better with all of our all of our garden animals, right? All right. Now, what about making pictures with these foundation models? Well, my daughter, my eight-year-old daughter, made this one. You know, she put she put into the GPT, show me an image of a squirrel in a garden, and she got this beautiful picture, right? And this is the world of creativity that we're in today, right? You can do this endlessly. It is so fascinating. And so then I put in my garden guardian <laughs> give me my pea shooting ai guided robot i want to see this feature that i could possibly make in my backyard and look what i got from that prompt this is what i got that's how smart these things are to understanding the world today all right now of course you see the pro some of the problems here right the, uh, the, the peas aren't being shot at the squirrel like I asked because it has guard railing in it not to show me that kind of an image. Does that make sense? <laughs> and it thinks strawberries grow on trees. <laughs> okay, come on, chat GPT. You got to figure out that. So there's a lot of things it doesn't understand, but look at what you get. Isn't that incredible? It actually gave me this thing that looked kind of cool. Like, oh yeah, I'd like one of those. <laughs> at least for shooting fertilizer, right? <laughs> okay. And then just when we think these things can't get more powerful, we get something like, like this, like Sora. Right? And I wanna show you now, I wanna show you Sora, okay? And this came out just last month, right? What is Sora? Sora is a, an AI version, it's a video generating AI, you just talk to it, and you get up to a minute of full motion 3D video that is indistinguishable in most cases from reality, right? And all of this that you see here is generated by a system that is seen, so there's, there's your sci-fi movie, right? So your kid can make sci-fi movies talking to the computer. What an incredible, incredible world we live in. This can be done just with some, you know, give me an animated scene with a close-up of a short fluffy monster kneeling beside a melting red candle. A 
paper craft world of a coral reef rife with colorful fish. Paper craft. Close up shot of a Victoria crowned, I don't know what that is. Here's a fun, fun one. Photorealistic close up video of two pirate ships battling each other, sailing inside a cup of coffee. <laughs> oh my gosh. What? Young man in his 20s sitting on a piece of cloud in the sky reading a book. All right, that's neat. We're exploring dreams. That's the world we're finally in. Isn't that unbelievable? Okay. Then um, my favorite one, they're not showing here. I think it's further down. Look at this one. Give me some historical footage of California during the gold rush. Oh my goodness. Let's go back into history. Imagine being able to stop and click on any one of those things and get information about it if you're in high school. Right? Imagine how much more you can understand the world you came from, the world you're in, and the world you're going to. What a time we are living in. Okay? I could go on endlessly and show you these things, right? But that would be kind of like me in the rabbit hole, <laughs> focusing in. Okay, we got other stuff to talk about. We got to move on. Right. But I want you to go and look at Sora. OpenAI finally has a name that we like. Chat GPT. What the heck was that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So I want you to go and explore uh, Sora. Uh, just go to the Sora web, web page if you want to see. A lot of problems with this technology. What are the, some of the benefits in, in green? Well, there's something called upscaling. We now know that all those old grainy, you know, uh, movies we used to watch, you know, and the black and whites and all, we know those are all going to be, and all the old crap games, sorry, not crap, all of the primitive games that you, some of you guys played, you know, back in the day, all that stuff's going to be upscaled to this level of resolution because that's an easy thing for AIs to do today. Oh, that's very nice. Good. I want to watch all those 50s movies in beautiful, you know, color uh, with modern, you know, tones. Neat. Okay. But there's lots of issues here too, right? Intellectual property issues. People, these models shouldn't be allowed to train on, on uh, IP that someone else owns without paying a licensing fee. They can't replicate our images, right? Without our consent, all that stuff's gotta be worked out. And this is a powerful foresight tool, right? When the source finally released publicly, right? That's right now all the red teamers are using it, trying to get, make sure it doesn't do bad things, right? Show me a vibrant or threatened green bay in X ways with Y conditions. You're gonna get this really interesting image that you can then think about, right? Be useful to you, right? All right, so now we gotta to get to one of our last slides in the science section. How do we make the AIs trustable? Well, we already know how we make animals trustable. We select for symbiosis with us, loyalty, trustability. And the ones that we can't trust, we don't replicate them, All right? That is exactly, that's called natural alignment. That is exactly how we are fixing, working with these AIs today. There's an AI that Microsoft has called Sydney. It's one of the ones behind Bing and red teamers have been able to get it to do crazy things. <laughs> Basically talk about humans as slaves and all kinds of strange uh, responses. They're gonna shut that one down pretty soon because they can't figure out how to stop it doing that. Does that make sense? But all these other ones don't do that. That is exactly what's called the normal curve of a complex system. You and I are, almost all of us, very pro-social, empathic, ethical. We try and understand the center, the middle of that normal curve. And then there's always a few people up on the extremes. And you got to pay attention to those people. And if they're doing some bad things, you got to try and help them fix those bad things. And if you can't, you put them in boxes. Does that make sense? You fight them, you put them in boxes. That's always been true. That's always been how humans have made our societies adaptive. And that's exactly what we're gonna do with these AIs. I want you to envision a world 20 years from now with robots, with AIs cohabitating your space. 
and you're thinking of them all as Labradors or whatever your favorite dog is or cat. If you're a cat person, I love cats too. <laughs> cats are a little less trustable than human than dogs, right? <laughs> they do their own thing, but still they're trustable, aren't they? That's the world we're going to. A world with all these AIs that are called black boxes. We didn't design them. We, we grew them up. We gardened them and trained them. And yet the vast majority are right smack in the middle of that normal curve. Right? That's the best alignment model that uh, people have come up with today. Okay? When I just, that Weeble story I just told you. Right? And then the last science uh, section slide turns out that human values fit a curve like this. Okay? There's a book called The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt. Haidt excuse me, Jonathan Haidt. And he basically said liberal values and conservative values are universal. And so are centrist values. And with studies in the last 20 years, this is an area of social psychology, studying small kids, the social psychologists have finally started to figure out that these values, we all have all eight of these values you see here. We all have care, sanctity, equity, proportionality, authority, loyalty, diversity, and liberty. But on the liberal side, it's a very individualist perspective. Right? The ones you see on the, on the lower left. On the uh, conservative side, it's a very group perspective, authority and loyalty. And then the centrists in the middle, uh, those values are, are predominant. So you get social justice on the left. You get criminal and economic justice on the right. And you get justice as a whole. And I recommend this book, probably the single best book of the last 10 years, actually 11 years old now for really understanding how the right, left, and the center all are value specialists. And these are the kind of values that these AIs will eventually learn. We're going to garden them up to understanding that all of these perspectives are important and we're always trying to find that center, right? Because that's, the center is the network perspective, right? Right, right, technology. There's something called Riston's Law, CEO of, of Citibank, and he said, Capital goes where it's well treated, right? And this is true with generative AI. Who sees the value of this? Well, right now, there's a state of California report that just came out that talks about the opportunities and the threats of generative AI. Beautifully balanced report. And I recommend those of you who are in state government, go to that report and look at it and it turns out my wife actually wrote the first version of that in 2018. It's called the AI Roadmap for California. She was at Google at the time. And uh, she was one of the three people that uh, created that roadmap. And now, here we are, uh, just uh, five years later, and we have a report on generative AI. What a time we're in. So what about corporate? Who's leading corporate? Lots of people. I, found this wonderful example from uh, Frodert Health in Medical College of Wisconsin of something called Layer Health. So Layer is putting generative AI into medical chart review. So it's taken all that patient data and it's creating these beautiful summaries for doctors and nurses and other patient care um, team members of that person's chart. So it's another window in to that person's medical history and their current issues, right? And this company, Inception Health, which is a VC arm of uh, Froder Health and Medical College of Wisconsin, um, you go to their website, if you want to see people in your network here who really understand the future of generative AI, there's like 40 people there that uh, really impressed me doing the research for this talk, is people that are saying, okay, how do we apply this in a very powerful next step way for our patients, right? Okay, universities. How are universities leading it? Well, my university, just two, two miles down the street from where I live, University of Michigan, just raised, uh, put $75 million into OpenAI for their VC arm to look at University of Michigan's data and say, how can we use this in a way that benefits our students better, right? Uh, who's leading in hardware? How many people have heard of NVIDIA? <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. 
So 110 fold increase in value in the last 10 years, right? Why? Because their, turns out their graphics processors that all our kids were running games on turned out to be perfect for running these large language models. And then they realized 10 years ago, 12, uh, in 2012, that they were actually an AI company, not a gaming company. And then the whole, the whole race started, right? And now, and those chips are, they use, they use the amount of energy of one house every day, one of those chips, to do these generative AI models. And we say, well, that's not sustainable. Remember my Kumi's Law example? There's a chip, an optical computing chip, it's called Silicon Photonics, that uses a million fold less energy to do the same thing. Those chips already exist. They route all of our fiber optic cables in something called Datacom. Those chips are coming to AI probably 10, 15 years from now, but they already exist in Datacom, so they're coming to, to AI. We know, we know that the te te technology works, right? And so what are we doing? Right now, everybody is piling out of Taiwan because of, this, because of the insecurity of its future, even though 90% uh, of all the advanced chips are currently made on that wonderful little island, right? Which many of my friends live there. They, they, they care about uh, uh, freedom and democracy, but they're in that same precarious boat that Hong Kong was just 10 years ago. We saw what happened to poor Hong Kong, right, in terms of the crushing of its democracy, right? So everybody right now is trying to build uh, net, uh, chips, and we all know the uh, Chips Act of the United States and then the Infrastructure Act, where all the money has come for us to build these networks here, and we are. We're doing it, right? So we're... We're, we're, we're taking care of that network that we need to, okay? How cheap are these things? A lot cheaper than you'd think. If you want to run a chatbot today and for your business, and you're going to get a thousand requests a day to it, it's going to cost you under a thousand dollars a year to use OpenAI's chatbot in, th in their marketplace. Now that's a very big advance. How many people don't like chatbots today? I, I, I just don't want to use them. But when they get to a certain level, suddenly everyone uses them. Remember what happened when ATMs first emerged? And, uh, I don't know if I want to use this thing. And you know, so people were going into the, they were going in for just a little while and then suddenly, wait a minute, this thing works. <laughs> I'm not going into the branch anymore. I'm just using this thing. There's going to be a, there's going to be a flipping point in the usefulness of these chatbots. You watch over the next five years. You're gonna see them on the front of everything. And if you wanna build and train private data on it, today it's gonna to cost you $150,000 to train up an entirely personalized version of these chatbots and you put it on a platform called uh, Amazon Bedrock, Amazon Web Services, all right? And that 150,000, the full-time salary of one of your uh, tech people today, right? Uh, that'll probably be 75,000 in two or three years, right? That's how fast it's dropping, okay? And then, of course, that's a one-time, right? Pay once, and then you get the chatbot for as long as you want to use it until you're going to create a new one, right? Garden up a new one. All right, so this stuff starts to open up questions for us. This is called the chart of the century. It came out two years ago because it was the first one that visualized just how fast all the costs of these IT things are dropping, that's the blue curve. And then all these things that are still rising in price, that's the rows of the red curves, right? Housing, uh, medical care, college tuition, right? Various human services. How do you use the blue curve to disrupt the red curve? Turns out uh, just last year, a $12 smartphone came out in India. Now this is almost as good as an iPhone. It's 12 bucks. 300 million people in India, the last 300 million who don't use smartphones, they're all flooding onto this thing right now. Right from being 2G or no smartphone, right? But we're plugging the last holes in this network right now with this incredibly cheap stuff. Now that's positive because we can start using those tools to attack those uh, difficult things like education and healthcare and 
housing and all the other things that we care the most about. All right. Well, this is going to be my most um, futuristic concept that I'd like you guys to, to really think about. And this is called the personal AI. What happens when you have an AI that has a model of what you care about? Model of your values, a model of your interests. What happens when that's on your, on your cell phone and that model is in your private cloud, so it's encrypted in your private cloud just like your email and your texts and your photos. No one else has access to that but you. Right? How, does that, how does the world change? How many people saw the movie Her? How many people saw that? Spike Jones, 10 years ago? Yeah. That's worth seeing. It's fun. It's an, it's an entertainment movie that was the first movie that showed what's called, what was called in the movie a personal operating system. Basically just a... Uh, Joaquin Phoenix was talking to this little AI through his little phone that he had in his pocket and it started like advising him on what to read, what to watch, who to connect with and he was training it. Yeah, more of this, less of that, just like the way we do if we, you know, swipe left, swipe right, right? Okay. And both the proprietary and the open source versions of this are coming. So the companies and then the kids in their dorm rooms, just making it and putting it up for free. Right? All of those, both of those kinds of AIs are coming, right? And are actually here today. Has anyone used either personal.ai or Pi? PI. All right. So small penetration today. Personal.ai will take all your Google Docs and texts and email and snarfs it all in and then it'll, as you're writing text, it'll like remind you, oh, well you also talked about this before that's related to that. Would you like to say this or to say this text in this way as you're texting? Does that make sense? Interesting, huh? And Pi, by inflection, uh, one of the founders of Google DeepMind, uh, is it's kind of an emotionally supportive and kind chatbot. <laughs> Best way to describe it. Okay. So if you're kind of having issues, you know, getting triggered by certain words or whatever, you know, you got to kind of, okay, talk to Pi and maybe Pi will give you some cognitive behavioral therapy and you can kind of get yourself out of that obsessive compulsive or whatever. Right. And Pi is, it's got almost a billion dollars of funding money behind it. This thing is not going away. Okay. This thing's going to be guardrailed. It's going to be more and more useful. And at a certain point, the training data is not just going to be your personal past conversations, but it's going to start having a deeper model of you. You're going to be able to put more and more information in, and then it becomes like this uh, uh, digital you. Does that make sense? That's a different world. And over the next 10 years, that's something we really all want to think about. So what will our Pi, our personal AI, be? What will it be like? Well, remember Carson and Downton Abbey? That's one thing. It's going to be this wonderful butler that's anticipating your needs, helping you do scheduling and, you know, think of places you might want to go similar to the ones you've already been, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's also kind of like a partner. Anybody see uh, Bicentennial Man? Anyone? Yeah, that's a great movie. That's uh, Isaac Asimov uh, um, story. And it'll even be a digital you. All right? This company was the first one that basically tried to create this personal AI that uh, you could leave to your kids when you pass away. And that really kind of creeped people out. So I don't think they ever, they ever, they never scaled, right? But remember, people aren't actually going to be using it this way. They're not going to be using it to create something for their kids afterwards. But that's what they will have. Just by using it during your life, it's going to have all your best stories. It's going to have your photos. It's going to have all this. You can be able to lecture to your kids still. <laughs> okay, don't do that, right? Why? Just because you have this assistant, this sidecar, this buddy bot, all these different terms people have used, right? For a personal AI that is hopefully nudging you towards your best self and kind of guarding you against those things you want to get out of. Does that make sense? That's a very different world. All right. Now let's talk about 
how do these tools clean up some of the problems we have today? There's a lot of clickbait, a lot of fake news, there's a lot of stuff on the web we don't like. Well, we have to talk about graphs now. So, a knowledge graph is Google's model for understanding how the web works. That little thing you see on the right, that little looks like a Wikipedia thing of Thomas Jefferson. You Google Thomas Jefferson now and you see that thing up in the upper right corner. That was all put together by an AI. And that started in 2012. What really got interesting was 2050. What happened then? That's when the AI got smart enough to understand factual inaccuracies on web pages by comparing against other web pages and started punishing any web page that had three or more factual inaccuracies and gave it a lower page rank. That's when the web started cleaning up clickbait and fake news. And now you put in any topic and you got a, the stuff that has a lot of fakery on it, it's gonna be buried way down in the search ranks, like pages 10, pages 15. Even if it's highly ranked by other people, it's not gonna be fake, Google's not gonna get faked out by it. Does that make sense? That's a very interesting world. Now, why don't we have that on our social media? Why don't we have that on, on YouTube, right? Why don't we have that in, um, on uh, X or whatever, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, chat, tool you use? Well, the main reason is it's going to make less money for all those people who own those platforms. Because they're using an auction model paying for the highest bidder, right? Are you going to have those kind of tools on your personal AI that's filtering all the data that's coming in? You better believe it. As parents, we're going to put them in all of our kids' filters. Right now, you go into even YouTube Kids and you see lots of stuff you don't want to see, including a bunch of stuff generated by automated AIs and the poor parents are putting their kid in front of this um, you know iPad and oh yeah it's got a million views it's got a million views because it was a kid it was a kid oh yeah I'm gonna keep clicking on that thing that's interesting but it wasn't built by a person and it doesn't have a human centric script in it it's got parrots with three eyes <laughs> because the system generated that and it isn't smart enough to really understand parrots don't have three eyes, right? So we're in the first generation of these tools and they haven't been cleaned up, but we have to require these platforms to add those graphs, right? Does that make sense? Values graphs, truthfulness graphs. I gotta be able, as a parent, to have that kind of control that's already emerging on the biggest versions of these tools and they need to be on all of our tools, okay? So that's a positive. So what does the world look like in the 2030s when these graphs are everywhere? Well, we're gonna get a web that has a public and private knowledge, truth, sentiment, values, goals, tasks graph. You're gonna be able to start finding the three people in the country who have publicly said they want to work in this particular startup or do this or solve this particular problem or volunteer on this particular issue or in your community because all of that information will be up in the graph does that make sense what i think is particularly exciting is being able to complain my last bullet there on any pro about any product or service that i'm using as i'm using it wouldn't that be nice Right, And I would love to have that complaint go privately to the manufacturer of that product if they're going to give me a discount on the next time I purchase. And if I don't get that discount or if I don't particularly trust that manufacturer, I just want it to go to the public graph. Does that make sense? Now, what does that graph look like? That's a graph of all the pain points that all of us have dealt with in all of our interactions with all of our technologies, with all of our groups, that all of our entrepreneurs can look at that and see, oh, that's a problem, I'm gonna fix that. Oh, that's a problem, I wanna focus on that. Isn't that a fascinating world? That's a, that's a fascinating world, right? And we're gonna be able to take those graphs and map them to our physical maps of the world. How many people have used the reviews on Google Maps? Yeah. Do you, how many people use those over Yelp 
or uh, any of the other advisors. Yeah, that's me. Now, from now on, I'm using that because I just look at the neighborhood and yeah, I want somebody in this neighborhood who's now part of my community who does this thing. And if I like that service, I'll easily comment on it on that map. I want that thing attached to a map because then I get something like this. This is a crime map of by county in the entire United States. And all the dark reds are the areas of the highest crime. Now when you get a semantic graph, that's called, with a geographic map combined, what does that do for us? That empowers our foresight. Because we look at that and we say, oh my goodness, look at those areas in Alaska, look at those areas in, uh, along the Mississippi River. I want to focus on those particular communities. I want to give them extra resources. I want to get that deep uh, problem. I want to get that area fixed first. Does that make sense? It values prioritization implicitly coming from these graphs. That's a very powerful and a positive, positive future. Okay? And it gets even weirder. Smart glasses are here. They're here. 20% of us use a smartwatch or a fitness tracker in America today. 20%. A lot of people didn't think they were going to blow up as fast as they did. But hey, they're useful now, right? They're actually useful. So smart glasses are the next thing they're going to be useful. The first versions that are actually useful, they're now 330 bucks, still expensive, come up from Meta. A smart glass is a, is a set of glasses that has a little camera in the corner, and you turn it on whenever you say, in this case, hey Meta. Instead of hey Google, it's hey Meta. You turn it on, a little red light comes on so people know that you're like recording or taking pictures. And what do you do? Well, you see the world and you get interpreted. With the smart glass, I'm looking at this wonderful person I want to know, but I can't remember their name. And I get their name whispered through the little frame right into my ear. <laughs> I'm, looking at, I'm looking at some stuff I want to grill. And I'm saying, hey, Meta, how do I cook this? How do I grill it? How long? Right? I'm getting off a plane in Germany, and I'm going to this place, and, I know, and my, my little AI says, hey, you know, your friend likes this thing. Let's go to this uh, farmer's market, and then I'm going to say, hey, Meta, and then my friend's going to be looking through my glasses at the thing that I'm doing, and I'm going to haggle, and I'm going to buy that thing, and I'm going to take it home. Or, hey, I... I don't know how to do this thing. I'm going to say, hey, Meta, get this person to help me, show me, and now I'm going to fix my plumbing thing, right? And then the thing is going to say, okay, good, you've used friends like three different times. Uh, you got to do something for someone else in your friend network. You can't be a free rider. So here, what are you going to do? Here's a, thing, a list of things that they ask you to do. Or just go off of this gift, gift list and buy them this damn thing, and then you're done, right? Okay. That's a world where... Groups start to outcompete individuals. Highly connected groups. People are going to feel naked if they're not in a group with other people working on a complex problem. And one of the coolest science fiction books that explored this came out 10 years ago. Uh, Rainbow's, or Vernon Vinge's, sorry, more than that, 20, 2007, Rainbow's End. A bunch of high school kids solving complex problems, working together in groups using those kind of glasses that I mentioned, right? That's a world where you uh, look down on your watch, which now is probably going to be something more like a bracelet because it's going to have more information, or at least a big old smartwatch. You know, the, the, we, some of us guys like those big chunky ones, right? And that's where you get your vis visual information if you want it, right? And your audio information is constantly coming in here with dockable earbuds you can take off if you want to make it private, right? Right off the right off the frame, stick them in. Right? But they already are very quiet. They whisper through the frame so most people can't hear it. Right? That is a very different and interesting world where 20% of us are using those. Right? And uploading all that video, sharing it. Right? Different world we're going to. So now we get to economy. First thing to note, a big picture 20 year view that Phil wanted us to have is the West is just exploding, exploding in the wealth that it's creating. 
Alvin and Heidi Toffler, those futurists I told you that gave us that three P's triangle. They had a book came out just before they both passed away that explained all of this. America is growing its GDP per, per capita faster than any other country. And that's good, but it's also disruptive. The rich poor divides grow the fastest in our country compared to any other country. Now they were growing even faster in China until recently. And what has happened in the last five years in China is they've greatly slowed down in their growth. Why? Two reasons. Number one, they're too top down in their control of their country and they're building, using AI to build a surveillance state that we're all thinking, oh, we don't want to go to that. And number two, they have not been able to make the knowledge economy, economy transition that I told you about. They tried to move from manufacturing to knowledge, but will the West trust all of their IT networks, Huawei and all of those tools they're gonna build on top of that? No, no. Because of that, because of what they did in Hong Kong and because they're too top down now, right? We're too scared of that. So they are stuck, they're in a tough spot where they can't lead, they can't make that leap to the knowledge economy services that everyone in the West is, wake, is making led by the United States. So that's good news. But it's also, as I said, disruptive because rich poor divides, they're gonna accelerate for a while until we figure out how to, to revitalize that vital center, right? Our middle class, our small manufacturers, right? We're gonna have to figure that out. So that acceleration of the value in the knowledge economy is why we've seen stocks go crazy in the last 10 years. The 10 year inflation adjusted return of the US stock market has been what? Guess, someone, give me a guess. It used to be historically 6%. It's 12. It's 12%. It's twice what it was historically. That's amazing. That means if you are invested in the stock market, either in the broad index or in a tech index like QQQ, right, the number one tech index, you're going to continue to see these incredible accelerating returns. It's going to outperform real estate, which is the second most in the desirable areas, right? Because real estate grows based on the salaries everyone's getting from the tech, right? It's going to outperform commodities, it's going to outperform any other thing you can think of as far out as we can look. So anybody here have a Roth IRA? Wonderful. Now that's a tax, after tax thing. It's the biggest single tech uh, tax giveaway that American uh, citizens have. Right? How many people here have a custodial Roth IRA? Fantastic, I see a few hands. As soon as you're paying your kid an allowance, the age of eight is what's typically uh, considered. All you have to do is have them document their work that they do around your house, you know, cleaning things up in your home office or whatever. You can start paying them in a custodial Roth, tax protected, and they can get on that exponential 12% a year 10 years earlier than most people realize. Fidelity or Schwab will open that for you. It takes 20 minutes. I opened one for my eight year old, okay? What kind of return is she gonna see if I put 6,500 a year, which I'm allowed, that's the maximum? Over 50 years, every one of your kids gets financial independence sometime in their 30s to 40s, depending on how you define that term. That's Incredible. But it's something we have to actively make the decision, the discipline to do, right? To be in the market. So that's a big economy uh, takeaway we can ask ourselves. Are we doing that? By the way, Australians invest more in the market than Americans because they are default nudged into the market through their retirement, uh, through their uh, their 401ks and such, and we are not. 
Americans have to make the active choice. Does that make sense? So, something to consider. Three big picture concepts I want you guys to noodle on for the future of the economy. This wonderful book from these two MIT professors, Machine Platform Cloud, simplifies this future, economic future that we are in. First, they say, human and machine teams are going to continue to outcompete individual people. Remember what Tom Frey said? Using the AI, humans that use it and humans that don't, that's the real competition. Second, platforms are going to outcompete products and services. Wherever your product and service can be inside of a platform, a network that people use, a market, they're going to outcompete the individual ones. Third, crowds of individuals or networks of, indi of, of businesses are going to outcompete individual institutions. And these are the three drivers of digital disruption, and they're why the average lifespan on the S&P 500 went from 60 years to 18 years today, and why uh, all of these top companies are now digital platform companies in the market. Right? So let's look at each of these three briefly and get a sense of what that means. Well, one of the leading digital networks is something called Amazon Web Services. This platform runs 80% of all the most complex software today. And everybody else's, Microsoft's, um, Google's, all, those, all their cloud platforms, they were slightly late to the game. And they're all like secondary. They're considerably secondary. So when a platform launches first, it gets what's called a winner take most dynamic. So in every industry, when these new, as these platforms emerge, you want to ask yourself, there are first mover advantages for a platform. In many cases, we want to be what's called a fast follower, second mover, watch somebody else experiment and mess around. That's not true in platforms. If there's a new platform coming, you want to be part of it. You don't want to be late to the game. Okay? Amazon Web Services, by the way, has decreased its price per service, per computation, per whatever it's offering. How many times since it launched over 10 years ago? 75 times. Remember that blue curve I told you about that's disrupting the red curve? Cheaper, 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 cheaper. More and more capability on these complex things. Okay. Platforms. How many people know what GitHub is? Excellence, the most important platform that I think we should think about. What is it? It's the Facebook for coders. It has 100 million developers that can pull down free software, mess with it, apply, try and apply it to something. It's like, think of it, the biggest tool, the biggest tool wall in the world, <laughs> okay? And a huge pile of it now is this deep learning code where kids can pull down a deep learning model, they can train it, and they can say, yeah, it worked great here, it didn't work great here. You know what a leaderboard is? Kids use it in, in, uh, on their games. You know, who's number one, who's number two on a game like Call of Duty or whatever. Well, the open source community has built leaderboards for all of these AIs. This is a leaderboard. This, this one works the best for this. This one works the best for this. And all the tech companies that are developing this stuff, they have to look at those leaderboards to see which ones I might want to use. So that the platform is leading in our understanding. All the kids are leading in our understanding of how these tools can be used and how we don't want to. And all the very best versions of these tools get put up for free by the big companies onto those platforms because they want those kids and young professionals, excuse me, the next gen, to be, they realize they completely dwarf any of the coders they have inside of their companies. Does that make sense? The network's winning, the platform's winning. And that leads us to crowds. We all know Kickstarter. Did you know there's platforms now for solving any complex problem in business? There's a platform called Innocentive where you can put up 10 to $100,000 for a prize for a hard problem that you don't know how to solve. There's 300,000 PhDs on that platform who will take a shot at solving your technical problem for you privately. You just stick it up. Isn't that interesting? You have an AI problem you can't solve, you put it up on a platform called Kaggle. 
there's 200,000 data scientists, AI experts will try and solve it for you. You want to hire somebody hour by hour? Go to Gerson Lehman Group. There's 350,000 technical experts in particular areas. You can hire for a particular thing hour by hour. Or you use a platform like Upwork. People, most people know that one. Yeah. Or Fiverr. Have you heard of that? Where you can hire people for as little as you know, $5 to give you a logo, whatever. All these people are actually being empowered by these tools to do good work. Right. So what does AI look like at the industrial level? Well, all these things you see are great examples of things that are being accelerated. Here in Green Bay, Schneider National has this new wonderful uh, logistics and AI innovation space called The Grove. Anybody seen it? Driving around? Beautiful space where they're giving, just like John Warner was telling us, giving us space for strategy. How do I apply it? Giving us space for strategic foresight. How do I think about how to use these tools, many of which Schreiber invented with its huge, if we, if we get a chance, go in and see all those walls of, of uh, videos where they can see what's going on in all the trucks all around uh, the country, right? They had to build that, that visualization and logistics um, network. And now they have a tool that they can sell to any other logistics network, whether it's in transportation or not, right? It's a great example of a benchmark for where we need to go with things like machines and platforms, right? And then we have things like cobots. Uh, here's a little uh, company in Medford, Oregon, and we're gonna take a moment and look at, um, this is a machine that will drill, that will package for you, and this little company in Medford, Oregon, these things cost $30,000 a piece right now. It's an arm. It's an arm that does things for you. How do you program it? Well, you just swing it around and you say, I want you to drill. This is how I want the arm to move. It has force sensors in it so that as soon as it does anything that wasn't in its programming, it immediately stops. This is what's called uh, uncaged human machine teaming. Right? You don't need to keep your robot inside of a space where people can't go anymore because it's now smart enough to do only what you told it to do. You get two of these arms together and it can pick things up, manipulate them. Right? And they put in, I think, 12 of these. This YouTube video, which is in my slides, uh, they, they put in 12 of these and got a 30% increase in efficiency with the same number of workers. And hopefully all the workers got a bit of a pay raise. That's what I hope, <laughs> right? In the same exact factory space, okay? And the next generation of these, you're not just gonna have to move the arms around, you're gonna be able to talk to them. Does that make sense? You can be able to use that generative AI on the front end, tell it what you want. It's gonna show you what it thinks those moves are for packaging or, or uh, um, any other a physical thing you want it to do. And going everywhere. Amazing, an amazing uh, and uh, important thing for us to understand, right? Okay. Right. So what happens when these These technologies are everywhere. What happens 10 years from now? Well, this is when what's something co it's often called conversational coding, right? You're just using the English language to talk to a lot of these things to do important things, whether it's in the AI space or whether it's in the physical robotics space, the automation space. The use of the English language becomes our most powerful, one of our most powerful tools for integrating AI into human and machine uh, teams, right? 
So this is when our liberal arts skills really start to become important. Our critical thinking, our ability to use language, our communication skills. There's a new book by Charles Duhigg, The Power of Habit, remember that book? Called Super Communicators. And this is all about those people we have on our teams who are constantly communicating and telling us what their intent is and kind of keeping the whole group glued together. This is when people skills become really, really important. And yes, you need technology skills, but people skills become the most important in the generative AI decade, don't they? And then you also want to ask yourself, what business value are you providing? And the ability to understand value when we have these graphs gets better and better and better. Because we see the sentiment, we see the complaints, and we see the visions. All that stuff becomes more obvious in the network and to ourselves when we ask questions. And of course, we got to think of ethics and empathy. How do we do these things? That becomes more and more obvious. The how becomes more important even than the why in that kind of a world. Because we're seeing the problems better than we ever saw them. Okay? And then, of course, learning and foresight, right? And now we need to talk about maybe the hardest one of all of the future of the economy. What happens when the AIs become generally intelligent? Let's say that's 50 years from now, or they say it's 30 years from now. What, becomes, what happens when we start to see not just tasks being taken away, but jobs and significant jobs? Back to our question about the future of the creatives, right? Well, there's this concept that's been around for almost 20 years now called basic income, universal basic income. Everybody gets some uh, money from just that incredible wealth that I showed you about. And Andrew Yang has this wonderful book. Remember, he was in the Democratic primary in 2020 uh, called The War on Normal People. And it has several, par several chapters in there of what happens if everyone gets, I believe it was $20,000, something like that, everyone gets from the government because they're taxing the corporations just a little bit higher now because they're all making so much money. And he talked about how you revitalize all these small towns because now there's millions of dollars, right? Got a thousand people in that town. You got a million dollars of disposable income that's going, or sorry, 25 million of disposable income that's sloshing around in there. And isn't that wonderful? There's just a problem with basic income. I don't think it's something that Conservatives, and I tend to be more conservative in some issues and more liberal in others, but conservatives won't accept basic income because you see what it has done in Saudi Arabia, where you have a whole dependency economy when they gave out all that oil money, right, last 20 years, and you see what's happened in some communities, disadvantaged communities in North America when we give out money and there's no attempt to help them integrate into society. So who has solved that? Denmark, in the 1990s, in the early 1990s, they invented what's called flex security. So what's that? Why is that different from basic income? It's basic income for everybody, living wage, given to you by the state, but you have to have a job or be trying to get a job. As long as you're trying to get a job or have a job, they cover the difference. The most exciting thing about this having that flexibility of the kind of job that you want is lots of people in Denmark are taking human services jobs that aren't necessarily going to be valued as much as other jobs in society. So what does that look like? It looks like something called Donut Economics. And this is the best single book I know by Kate Rayworth, the economist, explaining what that flex security future would look like. What she shows in this book is what was already happening in places like Denmark is we're revaluing what's called heed work. What is that? Healthcare, early education, all kinds of domestic work. It's being revalued when that money is available through the system and all the conservatives in Denmark accept it because everybody is accepting personal responsibility to find meaningful work. Does that make sense? 
fascinating concept. This idea, she thinks, everyone's going to understand over the next 10 years because it's a kind of basic income that empowers us. It's a very positive vision of how you're going to get beyond the simple GDP to these more subjective ways. It's often been called gross happiness product instead of gross domestic product. Right? Okay. To a different, more uh, inclusive economics. Okay. So I want to leave you with that thought from the economy section. All right, now we get to environment and health. Right? Most important curve to remember is called the adaptation curve. And this is a very simple idea by the Nobel Prize winning economist Simon Kuznets. Actually, he actually came up with this in the 1950s and now finally a lot of other economists get it. And it's basically when a new technology emerges it creates, it disrupts the system. Makes things worse in the first generation, they stay worse in the second generation, and the third they finally get better than they were before the new technology came in. Now his famous example was the Industrial Revolution. What did it do? It created huge rich-poor divides. The peak of that was the Gilded Age. Anybody remember that? J.P. Morgan, the founder of Chase, bailing out the U.S. government. <laughs> Here's some money, right, because you're so insolvent, okay? Huge, huge robber baron era, it was often called, right? And then in the third generation, we re-vote in redistributions, and that's the entire era from the, 19, from the 1890s in America all the way to the 1960s, where you saw these empowerments of the middle class, these thriving business, small businesses, right? Tremendous innovation. Because we've now taken the power of the Industrial Revolution and we've distributed it, right, with these new social security, with progressive income tax, 1914, da 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 da, da right, okay. And the environment works the same way. The Industrial Revolution made the environment worse in every country, in every city, and then finally we got rich enough to just clean it, start cleaning everything up, and that was the 1970, um, 1970 on, right, Earth Day, all the sustainability ethics, and now we're fixing all the stuff that made things worse. So that was an environmental Kuznets curve. And of course, technology does it too. First generation calculators make us lose the ability to, you know, you, to understand math. First generation uh, video games, we sit in our caves and we don't, you know, connect it to each other. First generation cell phones causing all these deaths, right? Third generation cell phones are going to be smart enough while you're using them not to let you hold them up to your ear while you're driving, right? Okay? Third generation video games, kids are going to be connecting up with each other to solve all these complex problems. It won't just be the silly first person shooters, it'll be these complex, I'm running for mayor, I want to do this, I want to lead a company. Those are the kind of simulations I want to put my kids into, right? We have some of those games today, but they're still about six, six, uh, 8% of all the games, they're called serious games, educational games, or edutainment, right? That whole sector is, is, can continue to grow and get more useful, right? That's the lean forward method, the incredibilization we were talking about as opposed to just fun or things that uh, distract us, right? All right. We're also in a world where now solar and electric future is going everywhere. I can't stress this enough. Many people think the future is not going to be as rapidly electrifying as it is, but it is. Look at solar. 300 times cheaper over the last 40 years because of that nanotech, the gentleman in the back. That's a perfect example of nanotech as you keep shrinking the size of these, of these uh, photo, uh, photovoltaics and increasing their efficiency right, of production and their yield. And so now we're seeing electrification of everything, even industry, even industry, which we didn't think was electrifying, is electrifying. BASF has this electric furnace, Rio Tinto has these electric smelters, fossil fuels we thought had to be at the center. No, they figured it out. They figured out how to use electricity for every major 
manufacturing application. We either have an application like those two I just mentioned, that's, that's a demonstrator, or we have people in the lab saying, oh, this is the startup we need to make next, right? And then if you want to see it in transportation, just go to this YouTube video, Norway's EV Utopia, it's called, right? 90% of all the new cars being electric in that country, they're going to ban fossil fuel cars one year from now. That means 10 years later, because that's the average lifespan of car in Norway, they're not going to be in. They're not going to be there. They're all going to be electric. They've electrified all their buses. They're electrifying their construction equipment right now. Those big, big, you know, what? What? How is that possible? It's because of this curve. Because the cost of lithium ion batteries drops every nine, ye every nine years, it goes up tenfold. It says 10x there, but that's not true. It's nine, nine. It's unbelievable. And of course, they're recycling all those batteries. The leading EV lithium ion recycler in Europe is in Norway. It's called Hydrovolt. So they grind them all down at the end of life cycle, and then they pull that lithium right back out, put it in a new battery. Isn't that incredible? They just shred it and then reuse it. Okay. All right. So what does this enable? It enables stuff like this. How many people have seen this YouTube video? This drone will change anything. Oh, nobody. Fantastic. All right. So who knows who Mark Rober is? Come on, Mark Rober. Yes. All your kids, hopefully. You guys have all been watching this, right? He's fantastic. All of his YouTube videos are fantastic. And he has all this engineering and STEM stuff. So he did this video last year about the most exciting drone application that he thought of. I cut my finger making lunch, so I placed an order for some band-aids a couple minutes ago, and now they're four seconds away. That is a nearly silent drone system that can deliver a package from the sky right to my backyard in as little as two minutes with dinner plate accuracy. And as far as I'm concerned, that's basically teleportation. This is the very near future of package delivery from a company called Zipline. It's been over a decade since we were first promised drone delivery that looked like this. And to be honest, I was never that stoked about it because I couldn't imagine that anyone would actually want something that big and loud with dangerously fast spinning propellers landing anywhere near their house. And that was a bummer, because with the explosion of people using Amazon or food delivery apps like DoorDash or Instacart, billions of doorstep deliveries are now happening every year. But when your lunch only weighs a few ounces, driving it to everyone with these two-ton gas-powered vehicles is wildly inefficient, bad for the whole planet, and not to mention just really slow. So this company, Zipline, is launching in four U.S. cities right now. Dallas Fort Worth through Walmart is going to serve 2 million people in that whole area. 2 million people with these drones end of this year. My city in Ann Arbor is getting these zipline drones and Sweetwaters, you know what those guys are? They make those high end salads. Um, all of the University of Michigan healthcare system is going to have these for delivering medicines to their patients. And what do these things do? Those little bread, bas ba bread baskets that you saw are um, any city, or sorry, any business that wants to deliver has a little thing on the side of their, of their, um, of their storefront or out front. They put the thing they want to deliver in that little bread basket. The drone comes drops its little thing, they attach it, picks it up, 70 miles an hour, whips it out to the customer, and then drops it 300 feet on the cable. Why 300 feet? Because you can't hear it. Because they used AI to design propellers that look like this, this little wishbone that you see instead of an ordinary propeller. And that means it creates a signature that sounds like a waterfall or just like rustling noise, something natural with none of those crazy spikes, those whiny spikes that we hate with the drones, right? Or with helicopter, the wop, 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 right? So one of the biggest issues people had, noise solved, and safety, safety. These things have um, four different, um, sorry, three different 
electric powertrain systems, all three would have to fail before the drone would crash. So it's not going to happen. It's going to be like the Apollo mission where we had three different electrical systems taking us to the moon, right? It's called triple redundancy. So the safety, the noise, and then the efficiency. What this does for us, for communities, is anybody who, let's say, is a, I have my hardware store. And I'm worried about, you know, Amazon coming in and taking away my hardware store. I put one of these things on the side of my business. I list my inventory up in the cloud on Instacart or whatever one of those platforms I'm going to use. And now you search using that Google Maps that I told, told you about. You know, you're fixing something in your house. Oh, God, I need to get that thing. And now you don't necessarily just go to Home Depot. You go to whoever you want who's up in the, in the network. You click delivery. Five minutes later, your thing comes. What have you just done? You've empowered all these local businesses to reach how far out? 10 miles, 10 mile radius, right? Next year, starting in Dallas, Fort Worth. Sorry, this year, end of this year. Fascinating, right? All right, so futurists are often asked this question, where's my flying car, future boy, right? Okay. <laughs> A long time coming, all right? Well, it's here. We're gonna see this at the Paris Olympics because two of the leading companies uh, in this space are launching there to show uh, the world kind of what these things are. Now, a lot of people thought we were going to get self-driving cars. Remember Elon Musk selling us this vision? Turned out it's much harder to do because the ground is very complicated. And we've had a total of 17 fatalities and over 700 accidents with these self-driving systems. So the entire self-driving future in America is being slow rolled right now. Not going to happen in the 2020s, maybe 2030s, right? What about the air? The air is a much simpler problem to solve. You can throw as many of these drones, as many of these self-driving, uh, many of these air taxis up in the air as you want. They're all going to slot into these lanes in the sky, like little ant trails kind of going where they want, at whatever elevation. Yes, you have a pilot in there for the, for the, uh, for the human drone, carrying drone. But the pilot has this huge AI assist. Does that make sense? Just like anybody who lands a 747, right? Or takes them off, has this, had this huge AI assist for over 20 years now. That's coming to all of these things. That's how they scale up without any of the problems that we're all worried about. How fast are they gonna go? 200 miles an hour. How cheap are they gonna be? A dollar a passenger mile. A dollar a passenger mile. But here's where it gets really interesting. What happens when you put that into planes? An electric plane. Anybody doing that? Yes. How cheap does it get? 20 cents a passenger mile. 20 cents. Because it's five times cheaper than a gas-powered plane. Five times. All the fuel cost on that curve starts disappearing. Right? You're getting your electricity for peanuts and your operating uh, uh, ma maintenance costs are vastly lower for anything electric uh, direct propulsion, right? All right? So what does that look like for Green Bay? When you get the Joby taxis, to just pick one of the leading companies, right, that's on the, on the stock market today, I think capitalized to almost $2 billion right now, so they're solving all the problems, they're going to get FAA approved in 2025, right? What do you get? You get 50 mile, 15 minute city. So what does that look like? That's a space where you can spend up to $50 and you're going to get to Sheboygan, Fond du Lac, anything that's a 50 mile range in 15 minutes. Now that's very interesting. What's even more interesting to me, because it's, it has even more economic benefits, I think, near connection benefits, are the electric planes. They go about 230 miles an hour, turboprop speed. 
Right now, if you want to go to Minneapolis round trip, that's $200. That's going to be $40. These are launching in 2028. A whole bunch of companies making them 30, 30 seat. That means all of your little secondary airports are now as usable as your primary airport because AI is assisting these things and keeping them safe. Does that make sense? They're very cheap. And now Madison, Milwaukee, Grand Rapids, Chicago, Minneapolis, they're all commuting distance. They're all commuting distance. Wow. And that is how much quicker than the high speed rail that we all want? How much sooner is that future coming? That future is coming in the 2030s, maybe the end of the 2020s. Right? And immediately next year, you're going to see these air taxis in four US cities. They're launching. They're taking over all the helicopter pads. You're going to see them for life. They're going to take over life flight, right? You know, for, for uh, hospital. The precision landing, all weather operations, because they heat, up their, they heat up their skins. You know, there's no icing issues, right? They have radar and LIDAR on them. They're never going to hit a goose, right? Remember the Sully movie from that wonderful, right? Okay. They have all of this AI assistance. And the current versions have a pilot and, and uh, five and four passengers. Getting from JFK to downtown Manhattan is going to launch at, I think, $60 round trip, 12 minutes. That's how it starts. Right? Amazing. These tools are also creating something, two words that we haven't heard for a while besides offshoring. We're friendshoring with these tools now. So we're finding companies where we move our, we move our factories out of China to say Vietnam or some other country that is more friendly to our politics, or we actually reshore. We just take the stuff that we globalized and bring it back. Who would have thought shoes would be manufactured again in the United States after 25 years of not being made here, right? So you go to, so you look at New Balance's factories in Maine and, and Massachusetts, thousand workers making shoes again, right? The question we have to ask is what comes next? A lot of stuff gets reshored step by step by step, okay? So that's a very interesting world of, with a lot of possibility. How many people have heard of 3D printing? It's also called additive manufacturing. So Xerox has a 3D printer for aluminum now. Who would have expected that as fast as it, as it has occurred? You want to make any product. This is not just the plastic that our kids play with, right? The plastic things. This is actual metal being 3D printed. And now we have a company called Canna that wants to disrupt the entire bottled beverage industry. All those plastics that we don't like throwing into the landfill. So this you go to Canna and you'll see their beverage printer. It prints, I think, 3,000 different um, drinks. A lot of your favorite drinks that you might get from your Coke dispenser if you go to the movies, but also a bunch of alcoholic drinks, a bunch of specialty drinks, right? They're selling these first to the, to the retail and then they're going to sell them consumer, right? You'll have this at home. That's interesting. What about medicine? Medicine is being revolutionized by these technologies. We got a company called Linus Health, which does online cognitive testing. And if you have any family members who are worried about Alzheimer's or any of those issues, consider getting them to use one of these online cognitive testing tools because they're getting really good. They have AI assistance. Did you know that you can diagnose Parkinson's 10 years before you see the physical symptoms by changes in the way you talk. And AI figured that out like three years ago. Isn't that fascinating? You can just talk to your online cognitive testing system and it's going to give you an evaluation of, hey, you're early Parkinson's stage. I want you taking these drugs. I want you changing this lifestyle stuff so you don't get it in your 60s or 70s, you get it in your 90s or 100s. Right? 
Freenome does AI analyzed blood work to tell you if you have cancer over a decade before in many different cancers now. HCA Healthcare just developed a sepsis detection algorithm. You guys know what sepsis is? Yeah. It, it detects in the hospital blood infection, sepsis, one of the worst killers in the hospital, six hours ahead of clinicians. So they're rolling this out in uh, health, healthcare networks now, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing, right? And to prevent that from happening. And then we have these things. If you have any friends who were uh, diabetics, they might use the Dexcom or the Abbott. And this is a this is a blood scanner. It's got that little tiny in green. It has that little tiny um, needle. And you stick it in there, and for two or four two to four week, weeks, it reports out to your little you know, to your smartphone or to your or to your um, other device what's happening with that chemical in your blood every 15 minutes. Right? Now, what does that enable when that's connected to a personal AI? Something we call quantified health. You can Google that phrase. This is a world where your healthcare team and yourself have an understanding of those critical chemicals that you need to regulate. Your cortisol level is a little too high. Your personal AI is going to say, all right, get up. Do a five minute walk, do a little meditation, do a stretch. It's gonna watch that cortisol come back down. What's that gonna do for you, right? Tumor markers, a drug that you're supposed to be on, blood thinner, it's gonna monitor that. Oops, you need to take another pill right now, right? What's that gonna do for you? Inflammation levels are high, go take a sauna. Go, go do a 20 minute sweating exercise. Kills your inflammation markers, right? Very interesting AI-assisted medical future. All right, let's talk about environment for a second. Today, we're desalinating water or fixing brackish water with something called reverse osmosis. It takes a lot of energy. We want to get beyond that. We want to get to something that's much more affordable. We want to get the West, which is in drought, fixing its fresh water problem. We want to get people stopping having these water fights trying to get water. I need water. Something called microbial desalination is the current leading candidate for how we fix that. A lot of people think we're going to have them at scale in the 2030s. We have them in labs today. What is it? It's bacteria that clean up the water themselves. Electroactive bacteria. Now, who's leading a lot of this research? Saudi Arabia, uh, United Arab Emirates. These guys are currently using lots of oil to get their wa fresh water and they know it's super um, bad for the environment and they know they need to get beyond oil somehow so they're doing a lot of research into this turns out they have harmful algal blooms just like green bay has in its bay and like lake winnebago has in its lake right the native american name for Winnebe Lake Winnebago is Stinky Lake, Stinky Lake, right? So that existed even before we had the nitrates and the phosphates coming out of the fertilizer making it worse. How do you, how do you clean something like that up? You got to have farms, think of a fish farm, of bacteria that clean it up naturally, that sit in the lake. They eat up the excess organic matter, they eat up the phosphates and the nitrates. Does that make sense? That's how you do something without huge amounts of energy input, the way we would currently clean up bad water, right? We learn from nature. And that's the thing that AI is gonna accelerate. So a vision that I could see for people who are working on harmful algal blooms here would be to partner with some of these individuals and take that 10 year, 20 year future and say, okay, how do we get to that world where we have, we all have the fresh water. We all have the uh, conditioned water that we want to see because nature figured it out a long time ago. We just got to get humble enough to realize we got to learn. Right? All right, politics. 
most important concept that I know, Weeble story that I know for the future of democracies is told by Rebecca Henderson at Harvard in this book, Reimagining Capitalism. And she says basically this, there's three pillars to a successful democracy. And I love her model because it's our triangle that we did at the beginning of our, our brief, right? It's the creators, the protectors, and the adapters, right? It's the individuals, it's the groups, and the networks. And what she says is all thriving democracy has got to have educated, empowered citizens, you know, the main creators. It's got to have uh, transparent and accountable states, the main protectors. And it's got to have free and fair markets, the primary adapters. And what we've seen in America since the 50s, since the information revolution, is another one of those incredible rich-poor divides because so much money, so much productivity has been unleashed. Right? Starting with mainframes, to minis, to personal computers, to the web, to the cloud, to the smartphone, to generative AI. So much wealth, so much productivity, that the market has started to capture part of our state, just like happened in the past. It's degraded some of those wonderful social safety networks that we built in the middle of the 20th century for the citizens. And her simple message is, okay, let's get the stool working again. Let's re-empower the citizens. Let's make the state transparent and productive, right? And less of this crazy polarization and find that center, right? So a simple way to say this with respect to the citizens, right? The, the main creators is we got two choices, two movies. We can lean back, we can lean forward. We can qualify, we can incredibilize. And there's a third movie here. How many people saw the movie Idiocracy? All right. <laughs> that's, a, that's a fun comedy from the 90s or something. It's a long time ago. Anyway. If we lean back too far, we get citizens that don't know what they want. They don't know what a good future is. They don't vote their true interests. And we get a dysfunctional society. Right? So we can all lean back a certain amount, but we have to have our uh, vital, a vital center of all of our citizens leaning forward. All right, what does this look like? in terms of values. Well, there's this wonderful online course you can take called um, Foundations of Humane Technology. It says, uh, how are we using technology today? Well, we're giving users what they want, right? Convenience, freedom. What we need is an AI, we need a platform, we need a service that knows what our vulnerabilities are and doesn't pull us into them. Does that make sense? Today we're prioritizing a profit metric in a lot of our platforms. What we want is prioritizing thriving and the subjective metrics of the people, of the users of them. Every single one of us, if we had a three question survey of Facebook, for example, we would give some really valuable information of what we don't like about it. Or how many people use Nextdoor? You know what next door is? I started off using it, oh, it was great, and then it suddenly became a place where I couldn't have any control, couldn't get away from the ads, couldn't create a private group, and I just, okay, that's not me, right? I'm not ready, I'm not ready for that, right? I wanna, there's always gonna be a public space, and there always needs to be a private space, just like there is in our house, right? And we need to have control over those tools and we're going to get to that kind of a world. And this course will give you a good example of that kind of future that we want. All right, so what does this look like for us as parents today? My kids are not old enough yet to use re Reels or TikTok or YouTube Shorts, but a lot of kids are using, a lot of the next gen are using these today, right? A lot of the next gen are using platforms like Timu or Shen which are directly shipping from Chinese manufacturers and bypassing all the US tariffs because of a loophole that was set up in the 1990s called through the International Postal Union. So there's no tariffs paid on those small packages like there is on everything else from China. 
we're going to fix that loophole eventually in the state, but for today, we're not. So I would ask you, are those platforms empowering your citizens and your companies? Or do you want to choose a platform like a Costco, Walmart, or a Target, or an Amazon, or a Netflix, Disney, Prime, or YouTube, all of which have, are giving back to their communities, people with surveys say, I love these platforms, they're doing useful things for me. Every single one of those streaming platforms that I mentioned is spending money on doc, uh, documentaries, on real world things besides just um, entertainment, right? Every single one of those platforms is trying to empower creators in different ways, at different levels. And then we have platforms that are just trying to attract us, trying to engage us. These are the kind of choices that we have that I think are really important. All right, so how do we fix social media? Two slides on that. First, you gotta enable people to escape ads. Does it make you a little angry that you can't pay for a premium version of these where there's no ads? Like I can pay for all my streaming a premium version? Wouldn't you like to see a bill from the government saying, I need a premium version? Because it wouldn't cost you much. They're not making enough that we, would, we couldn't all easily pay a small amount to clean up a social media like an X or a, or a, or a um, Instagram or what you pick your social media, right? And second, I need to be able to take back control of my private group. On Facebook since 2012, you have not been able to reach all of your friends on there with something you post unless you pay extra to Facebook for something called a boost. Have you heard of that? I'm going to boost what I'm writing. That's too um, extractive, in my opinion. If I made a connection to somebody, Facebook, you, or Meta, I guess they're called today, you can't get in the way of me communicating with my own group. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think we're going to figure that out. Today, we're just discussing it. It's a Weeble story today. Hasn't been solved. Second slide, something called the filter bubble. Everybody in this room should know that term, right? This is we like to associate with people who think like us. That's great. That gives us power. That's our tribe. That's the group. Remember at the bottom of the triangle? But what is the network doing at the top? We have to understand everybody else who thinks differently from us. We have to be able to work with them, even if we don't share all their values. That's called cognitive diversity. It's not the DEI that we hear about and the current you know, issues around that and ethnic diversity or skills diversity, all important. This is the way that we think about problems. Different people with different values. You remember our right, left, center? Can we work with those people? Turns out there's a wonderful book by Scott Page, who's just down the street from me at University of Michigan, political scientist, and he's shown that schools firms, uh, groups, and societies that value cognitive diversity and have it on their teams outperform filter bubbles for all complex problems. What is a complex problem? Something that doesn't have just a recipe that you, that you execute, like a well-engineered, uh, a well-known engineering or physics problem. No, this is a problem in an area that you haven't figured out. Strategy, marketing, leadership, management, they're all complex problems that you, where you need diversity. Diversity is going to beat the filter bubble every single time. What does this look like in social media? This platform, Ground News, is a perfect example. Let's say you're on the left or on the right. You go to Ground News to get your information. It has what's called the blind spot report. It will show you, you're consuming all your information uh, from your tribe. It will show you the people on the other side of the aisle who think differently from you and the, the most important thing that they think on that topic that's most related to what you're consuming right now and how do they think and how can you interact with them. Does that make sense? It solves our filter bubble. That's the kind of future we're going to. All right, society and AI. I told you about Conmigo, right, and the Socratic approach that it uses. We don't want to ban it. 
We want students to show their work when they're using these tools, but most importantly, we want them to use it in a way that incredibilizes them. And one interesting thing we should know about our future is there's a vision called Global English. And you, you guys all know that English is the global language of business. Look at that, look at that uh, blue bar there. How much more it's used as a second language than every other language. Okay. Turns out that those digital assistants that I mentioned are going to be able very soon when a kid is learning a language, I just went to Ghana with my wife, there's a language 2 million people, 2 million kids, 2 million uh, Ghanaians use called Twi. As those kids are learning Twi, which is only spoken by those 2 million people, they can learn English or Spanish or whatever, but almost all of them are going to learn English at the same time that they learn the Twi word for whatever it is that they learn. What does that do for them? That creates a world in 2040 where you have 300 million new virtual immigrants working with us, working with our young professionals, working with our recent grads to solve all kinds of problems. And all the bandwidth problems are gone in that world. And you have 300 million new underemployed, eager, hardworking kids working with your kids to solve all these problems. That's a very interesting, empowering world for the West. And so as Reshma Shaujani says, founder of Girls Who Code, we're all immigrants to this ever-changing digital future. All of us. We're always going to be that way. So taking this immigrant mentality and figuring out how to work with the people who have this American dream, want to work hard, appreciate their freedoms, be humble and brave, that's the knowledge economy vision, I think, that we need to understand. So takeaways. The AI goalposts are going to continually shift. So you want to ask yourself questions like, what are you doing now that's going obsolete? What new tool or ability did you just gain? What market can you grow or democratize with these? And what product or service can you now take up market and better personalize and specialize? Another big takeaway is that quality of life is really our top goal for a community. If you remember Bhutan's gross national happiness that I was mentioning earlier, right? That they do the survey that they do of all their citizens. And this famous survey from uh, uh, 2010 by Daniel Kahneman that beyond 75,000 a year, our happiness doesn't increase, it plateaus. You don't, we don't need a lot, we need enough. And enough is not that far out. And so hopefully with these perspectives, Web3, this AI-enabled web, is going to be more beneficial and more humanizing than Web1 was in 2000s and, uh, to, uh, 1990 to 2000, and Web2 has been today with the social networks, right? So a takeaway for us on values, I think, is asking ourselves, what are the values that have made Green Bay uniquely great? In my research, these are the ones that came up to me, right? I was looking at Vince Lombardi and his values and why you have such an amazing, uh, you're the smallest town with the winningest football team in America. How is that possible that you're title town? Because in 1999, 1919, your community came together and said, let's had the vision, let's all put a little money in the pot, let's make this thing happen. And so your vision, your action, your integrity, that's Lombardi, that's key, integrity, and your, commun your, your excellence, your commitment to excellence, along with community, have been the things that have defined this rise, this amazing rise that you guys have seen, and all of the new things that have happened in Green Bay in the last 10 years with Titletown and, and your... Um, rail yard and all these incredible, incredible revitalizations. It's the start. It's going to be even more amazing in the next 10 years. Okay. And by the way, the uh, Fort Howard Paper Company and the Paper Converting Machine Company, they were both start, they were also started in 1919. <laughs> all of these visions 
and what 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 is the the fruits of those visions so another takeaway is you know remember our do loop learning starts with learning here's a five minute daily ai podcast i challenge some of you in the room to listen to this thing you know go out take your five minute walk and listen to this five minutes it's called it's all it is it's called the ai breakdown listen to this guy i love him He's going to tell you all the latest crazy stuff happening in generative AI and AI in general. Learning. How does that change foresight? How does foresight change action? How does action go into review? Right? Another takeaway for you is there's this wonderful conference starting uh, happening next month in Oshkosh by another Envision-like community called Amplify in Oshkosh. 69 bucks, half day, exactly like this. It's 7 a.m. to 1 p.m., I think. 69 bucks. Drive down to Oshkosh, do this next month. Got these, uh, these six wonderful speakers. Take what we just discussed here and take it to the next level. How is Oshkosh thinking about the future of AI? And then consider taking this six-week course here at UW-Green Bay. Six weeks, 350 bucks, and now you're gonna have a certificate in AI. What does that do for you? It changes the way you think. You're now one of these creators. You're now connected up with other people who are gonna ask these questions about how do I use these tools as the goalposts continue to shift, right? And our last takeaway slide, if you wanna build an AI community, Create and support an AI meetup. There's a, the one we have in Ann Arbor, our biggest one, a thousand people. Start an AI conference like the one I just showed you in Oshkosh. Start one of those here. Fund an AI incubator. Titletown Tech is already leading us in that perspective. And there's gonna be several more, right? How do we, how do we empower that? Grow your AI certificate and degree programs like the one we just saw at UW-Green Bay and regionalize. Remember my triangle. How do I connect up with Madison? How do I connect up with Milwaukee? How do I connect with all those, com all those people in between? Because there's so much activity happening in here. I looked at Ann Arbor and I found all these AI startups. I looked at Green Bay, I found all those. And I found some of them just from a web post and others I found by going to Indeed and LinkedIn to see who was doing AI hires. And I picked up several more where there's a company with one AI person, one data uh, um, predictive analytics person, one uh, data science person coming in. Does that make sense? All oh, those people, everybody's experimenting right now. And they're gonna continue. And of course, Madison, Milwaukee, there's a whole bunch more. Well, that's the ecosystem that's gonna help us figure this stuff out. So. My conclusion here is the future is very bright and that network's gonna help us figure these things out. And it's our students and our young professionals that are gonna lead the way. And I wanna thank you very much for your time.